Hello again, I'm Jonathan Ray, veterinary surgeon from First Opinion Practice. This video essay is part of the part two of a four-parter about the four dimensions of critical social justice politics present at RCVS. Part one was about diversity and the evidence for the rhetoric coming from RCVS. Parts three and four follow on and take in the equality, equity and civility dimensions. Inclusion is the second dimension of CSJ politics, and this is the one most closely associated with discrimination and bias. It is also the dimension which already has statutory boundaries, where cases of discrimination can be examined and sanctioned when conclusively proven under UK law. Society already strongly supports inclusion. For the, pro for the profession, inclusion is also the value which is probably the least contentious of all the four dimensions of the CSJ politics at RCVS. I mean, hands up those who don't want inclusion. I don't think there are very many hands raised at this time. So why is this a sensitivity for the woke at RCVS? The answer in its most simplistic form is that there is a semantic trick in play here, that in reality their talking point is the obverse of inclusion, it is exclusion, which allows for conflation with discrimination, bias and prejudice. We will come to exclusion, discrimination, bias and prejudice later, because first it's worth elaborating on a point made by our colleagues at BSA in their animated video about whether there is a serious problem at all with inclusion in our profession in 2023. Links in the, in the description below. Their contention is, in summary, that inclusion is pretty much complete in our profession in 2023. Because, you're, because all you need to find a job these days is a pulse and a license, the MRCVS. This level of inclusion is consequent upon the, cu the current employment market, where demand exceeds supply, where the job vacancies exceed applicants. The market, not any politics at RCVS, has made the biggest possible concern for any sensitivity around inclusion redundant. Surely. Anything working to achieve full inclusion should be hailed as a great thing. Well, you might think so. You might think RCVS would acknowledge this and let up on their concerns about inclusivity. But no, not so fast, because through a semantic sleight of hand, they have reframed inclusivity as actually being about exclusivity, discrimination, bias and prejudice instead. In our previous video on concept creep in the four CSJ dimensions, we noted how inclusion requires a gatekeeper, a person or organisation who determines which others, capital O, get in. RCVS is the statutory gatekeeper to our professional life and, as we previously noted, is responsible for the inclusion of undergraduates by controlling their training syllabus and graduates by controlling their conduct, ongoing professional development and levying an annual license fee. And RCVS goes even further by controlling those who can join exclusive subsets of the profession, the specialists in narrow fields, within the broader profession. RCVS is without doubt the gatekeeper to being included in our profession, and it is supported by statute and the authority that the VSA brings to, the withdraw, to withdraw that inclusion, to create exclusion, loss of professional identity, and loss of the opportunity to earn a living as a veterinary surgeon. When it comes to inclusion and exclusion, RCVS is the primary institutional influence in our world, as opposed to the non-institutional effect of the jobs market. So if the market for jobs is operating in a universally inclusive manner, and the RCVS is the gatekeeper to everything the profession needs to function inclusively, why do they still have a focus on inclusion? The answer is that they've gone far beyond their statutory role and included CSJ politics in their modus operandum. For this to be so, they have needed to shift their language, creep the concept across to examining the profession for exclusion, discrimination, bias and prejudice. It's not a statutory duty of theirs, it is driven by their political viewpoint post-2017. And, as previ previously noted, they have no clear mandate from the profession to do so.
For a statutory body with a statutory requirement to follow stringent process when it comes to the process of professional exclusion, and for a body which espouses a commitment to evidence-led behaviours and policy when it comes to exclusion, discrimination, bias and prejudice, the RCVS sets its standard for evidence as low as it can get, to nothing more than report. Whether it is inquiry into possible discriminatory practices excluding colleagues with disability or the allegations of discrimination from ex-presidents, RCVS places anecdote, the report of the lived experience, as the most important evidence for exclusion having taken place. See the video on concept creep to explain this, links below. Anecdote is accepted as valid by RCVS politicians if the person reporting their lived experience perceives exclusion, discrimination, bias or prejudice. At that point, RCVS process also reframes the aggrieved party as a victim. Once the victim is identified, circular reasoning takes over because victimhood means the case for discrimination, therefore exclusion, and therefore lack of inclusion are de facto. At that point, the perpetrator is identified and classified as prejudiced and a villain to be taken out by any means necessary. Those who have followed the cancellation of Professor Argyle's presidency will recognise the process. The reliance on perception and the acceptance of the victim's narrative that they have been discriminated against and thus inclusion standards have been transgressed is fraught with problems. Actus reus is the concept in law of the act or omission that comprise the physical element of a crime. You can see how this feeds into a victim's narrative when it comes to exclusion. The victim can claim exclusion both by reporting an act or words and by reporting an absence of act or words, for example being sent to Coventry. Mens rea is a crucial qualifier to actus reus, coined in the 17th century, this goes to the atten intention or knowledge of wrongdoing and is an essential part of judging the truth of a crime. At one extreme, mens rea can dictate whether you are charged with murder or manslaughter, for instance. Mens rea is essential in order to determine the seriousness of a crime. And when you are an alleged perpetrator, this is crucially important. Context is also important in calibrating the seriousness of a crime. For example, if you are introduced to someone new in a social situation, it is normal and polite to say hello and perhaps shake hands. If you know that person to be an ex-MRCVS, convicted of possessing pornographic images of children, see Cortez from 2017, you might choose to drop RCVS standard civility and ignore and therefore exclude that person. Context would have an influence on your behaviour and it would calibrate your response and the seriousness of your rejection and exclusion of that person from normal social interaction. If you do away with the requirement to demonstrate mens rea by automatically accepting that perception is all that's required to confirm discrimination, and if you do away with context, then you are saying that all victims can accurately intuit motive, that they can mind read, and that they are the sole and infallible judges of the contextual setting. A good example of this is President Green's blog, complaining about lack of salary and intuiting the cause. Here she intuits motive and relates this only to racial and sex discrimination. There is minimal information on context. There is no attempt to calibrate this event or check the truth of it. And all of this is platformed by RCVS. Unfortunately, Green's employment history is not extensive and even a cursory questioning of her previous employers would identify the transgressors. Given the accusation of illegal racial and sex discrimination she has made here, you can bet her ex-employers would want the context and thinking behind their alleged decision made clear. 
we can only wonder why RCVS would want to be associated with this allegation of employment malpractice. Then there's the event when the victim is actually a bad faith player in the RCVS inclusion narrative, where the so-called victim is a sociopath, Machiavellian, narcissistic, or a so-called dark empath. When these colleagues are operating, there is scope for false reporting and false, accu false accusation, with all the reputational damage that follows. A narrative of guilty consequent upon report is neither fair nor just, but this is the process in use to justify RCVS calling for greater inclusion in the profession. When it comes to evidence for exclusion and discrimination, inclusion politics requires nothing that is rigorous or fair and makes no distinction, no calibration between an event having the seriousness of a fractured eyelash or a profound and life-threatening trauma. These are the conditions which are perfect for reporting top-level statistics regarding prevalence of lack of inclusion, which RCVS should properly treat with a profound degree of scepticism in order to focus their efforts, funded as they are by the retention fee we all pay. There is no sign of this scepticism at RCVS. I don't pretend for one second to be a psychologist, so I'm choosing my definitions carefully to get to, get to my main point, which is where the inclusion narrative at RCVS has got to with respect to bias particularly what they see as unconscious bias. Some definitions. There is a study, links in the description below, undertaken by the Exeter University Psychology Department on behalf of BVA, which, in short, found that there was a bias operating amongst the test groups when it came to awarding improved salary and conditions in a hypothetical practice. The study concluded that the bias was characterised as unconscious and res resulted in discrimination on the basis of sex. Whilst there are a number of flaws and weaknesses in the conclusions drawn, the study served to introduce the concept of unconscious bias to the veterinary profession. Back at RCVS, the training received from Stonewall included Staff training and awareness raising or sensitization is integral to building an LGBTQ plus inclusive workplace environment. Addressing misconceptions and unconscious bias LGBTQ plus training is a key tool when responding to the challenge. Stonewall training was touted as a tool to reduce bias and therefore discrimination by addressing unconscious bias. By reducing discrimination, the aim was to improve inclusivity. There are several issues here. The first is that the aim to eliminate bias was actually an aim to, in, uh, aim to end prejudice, a creep of meaning. The second was the framing of any bias as only being negative, when in truth, as the Bristol definition makes clear, bias is ordinary and not a moral failing. The third is the aim to change the trainee's thinking, for which there's a perfectly good word in the English language, indoctrination, which only has negative connotations, for example, indoctrination as a tool of authoritarianism. See George Orwell. More of RCVS's predilection for authoritarianism later. And the fourth, which is the questionable degree of effectiveness for any training and the duration of the desired effect. None of these concerns have been addressed by RCVS in its headlong drive to social engineering, Headline as inclusion. Which brings us to RCVS, the inclusion champions, 
operate a gatekeeper role in respect of inclusion. It also headlines that one of its roles is setting veterinary standards. Failure to meet those standards results in exclusion from the profession or from a specialism. No one disputes the necessity of this exclusion in order to safeguard a public interest and professional reputation. But the point here is that RCVS are trying to have their cake and eat it. They are the gatekeepers and standard setters for the profession, creating exclusivity, yet they also want to be the beacons of inclusivity. And for that to, ha for that to happen, their inclusivity has to operate in different dimensions to its role in enforcing exclusivity. Thus, the, inclusion, the inclusivity narrative operates in a political sense and has absolutely nothing to do with our science or animal welfare. This dichotomy creates a dimension filled with standards and exclusion and a second filled with the lowest standards of evidence and proof and flirtation with authoritarianism through indoctrination. At a time of maximal inclusion of more work opportunities than available veterinary surgeons, are we absolutely sure this political agenda, as it is being prosecuted, is what we, in the profession, want or need? Thank you.